Welcome to this week's program of Ascend Live on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. Okay. Today, our guests are Casey Berghoff and Melanie Bell, certified teachers of the Enneagram. And they're going to be teaching us about the communication styles and how it affects the autism community. Will, tell us about your shirt this week. Gladly. This week's shirt is my new neurodiversity shirt. Uh, it represents different ways of thinking and different brain wirings and, and the different ways of thinking at the ARC and throughout the community. Very well. Very well indeed. Uh, uh, cut. <laughs> I know. So, uh, hello. Hi, Casey and Melanie. Tell us about your business. Basically, we help people understand each other using a personality model called the Enneagram which goes into depth about why people do the things they do. We work with a lot of businesses, organizations, and emerging leaders, including adults on the autism spectrum. How did you get into, into the anagram? I was already interested in other models of personality and then was introduced on the internet to the Enneagram, and I really appreciated the depth that it went into me and my personality and how I worked. It was very illuminating, more so than any other system I'd found. So I've been studying it and teaching it ever since. And I was lucky to be introduced to the Enneagram by a friend at a time when I was really trying to learn more about myself and figure out where I wanted to go in my life. And as with Casey, I found that the Enneagram really goes deep. You can't hide from yourself when you learn about your personality type. I started to understand myself a lot better and also the people around me. And suddenly my relationships with other people started to make a lot more sense. What is the Enneagram? The Enneagram is a personality system that not only describes what people do, but why they do things the way they do. There's nine different personality types which includes nine different core motivations. We've actually found that we can simplify it even further. There's three different basic ways that these nine Enneagram types communicate. Those are the three communication styles, and that's what we'll be talking about today on the show. How, does, how is this information helpful for people on the autism spectrum? What we've seen with people on the spectrum is that oftentimes they have great intellectual abilities and they're wonderful at working with systems and figuring out how things work. But oftentimes they have challenges understanding other people and where they're coming from. They can have challenges with social skills and communication. So what we've discovered with our friends and people we know on the autism spectrum is that it can be very helpful to have a system for understanding people because it utilizes these intellectual gifts and this ability with systems. Suddenly people aren't just mysteries anymore, but you can use a system to figure them out. If you know your friend is one personality type, you can apply what you know of the type to communicate with them better. And same with your family or people at work. Not only is this helpful for people on the spectrum, but we've also seen it be really huge for others as well, including leaders and business people and managers that we work with. There's a big aha moment of, oh, everyone's not like me, or everyone's not some defective version of me. They actually have very different ways of seeing the world. And if you start to see things from their perspective, you can communicate with them better. Excellent. We were very privileged uh, in Ascend to have you two give a presentation at the 2014 um, annual conference we had, and you were very well received there. Can you tell us what your interest or connection in the, the autism community was that led you to that and to working with people on the spectrum through your business? On a personal level, we have some friends and connections who are on the spectrum. We've learned a lot of interesting things from, and we got more involved in the adult autism community here in San Francisco, and we're lucky to have an opportunity to present and really see how the Enneagram is helpful for this community. 
We really felt we'd gotten into teaching the Enneagram and communication in particular, and we really saw the ways that the communication support would really be helpful and useful in this community. Excellent, excellent. Now, I understand uh, that there are three communication styles. Could you elaborate on those? And then if there's any particular tie-in to the community through one or more of those styles, if you could tell us about mm -hmm. that as well. Um, before we introduce these styles, we should note that we think all three of these styles or are found roughly equally in the world. So we think about one third of the world is one style, one third the second style, and one third the third style. And we think that all three of these styles can be found in people on the autism spectrum as well. It may just um, impact them a little bit differently depending on how their autism and their neurodiversity impacts them. All of these types are equal they all have wonderful gifts. Everybody can be a great communicator. And we all have times sometimes where we're not having as good of a day. So all of these styles have pitfalls and ways that they get tripped up in their communication, both in how they express themselves and in how they react to others. All of these types are fundamentally equal. It's about how we express ourselves. Are we using the higher side mm -hmm. of our style or the not as high side of our style? Um, could you tell us uh, about the three styles for our uh, viewers who may not be familiar mm -hmm. with them? The first one is called the soloist style. Mm -hmm. and these are people who march to the beat of their own drummer and are very attuned to their inner world of thoughts, feelings, and ideas. Because of that, they can be very creative and great at generating new, unique ideas that others may not think of. Mm -hmm. They also take a long-term view, so they can be very meticulous when it comes to strategy and thinking through the consequences of what they want to do or strategizing about their actions. They really think everything out before they start acting. So this can be really wonderful and a challenge can be that they also have a mm -hmm. slower pace than some other people. So in a meeting, for example, with lots of people who are very talkative, their voices might get lost. So the wonderful thing about this style is that they do help others slow down. And if you're working with someone who has this communication style, you can engage by letting them have the opportunity to speak up. So these are very independent-minded people. Mm -hmm. And if you relate a lot to the style yourself, you might notice that you're great at coming up with ideas and at knowing what you want, but sometimes when the outer world gets overwhelming or you get stressed, you might zone out. So in these situations, it's really helpful to ground yourself in your body. Pay some attention to your surroundings. Feel your feet on the floor. The littlest bits of grounding can be really helpful for this style in bringing you out of your shell and communicating clearly. And that's the soloist style? The soloist okay, style. Okay, good. Can you tell us about the other two? Mm -hmm. The second style is the initiators, and people of this style tend to be a lot more assertive. They're very focused on making their mark in the world. Um, in building a community, like an autism community, these might be the people really getting things started, really keeping things moving, making sure the meetings happen, making sure that people are doing things. They're very focused on meeting challenges. And if an organization or somebody is in a time of crisis or a time when a decision needs to be made quickly, these folks tend to ha have a lot of confidence. They tend to be able to make a decision quickly and move forward without questioning themselves. Um, because they're focused on immediate action and getting out there, they can be relatively blunt in their communication style. They tend to be straightforward. They tend to work hard, play hard. Often they'll enjoy a very spirited debate. The challenge for this style can be that sometimes they can be seen as a little bit overly pushy by the other styles and it can be harder for them to sit back and to hear the voices of the other two styles. In a group meeting, their voices may be the more dominant ones. 
Um, for people of this style, what they can really work on is being able to take a breath, look at the long range view. Sometimes it can be good to take more time to make a decision and to really listen to other people's perspectives and value that. Um, and taking time to connect with one's feelings rather than taking action. And in communicating with somebody of this style, really being able to be direct and meet them where they are and even debate with them a little is very useful. Very interesting. So that's the initiators. Okay. And finally, we have the cooperators. Mm -hmm. These are the most outward looking style and very focused on other people and what they need and how they can be of support. So some people call them the most altruistic of the styles because they really care about the common good. Cooperators have a structured mindset. They want to do what's best, do what's right, meet people's needs. Sometimes they're driven by ideals. And in order to help with this, often they'll want to follow a set of rules or sometimes create a set of rules, standards, or principles of how to do this. So this might be the person in an organization who comes up with the code of ethics and mm -hmm. make sure everyone's on the same page that way and is doing the work right. So these people are often found in supportive roles. Even when they're leaders, they're very much listening to the people they're working with and leading from an egalitarian standpoint. They tend to be responsible and committed. When they're under stress, the voice of their standards and rules gets increasingly loud. Oh, you should be doing this. Mm -hmm. You should be doing that. So if I'm a cooperator, I might start putting in extra hours, working extra hard without necessarily letting other people know that I'm doing so. So that can be kind of stressful as a cooperator. And what's helpful if I'm a cooperator and get stuck in this loop is allowing myself time to relax mm -hmm. and really think about where these standards are coming from and allowing myself more flexibility around them. Maybe my code of ethics is great for the group I'm working with in the U.S., but if we start working with a group in China, they might mm -hmm. have a very different idea of what's the right way to do things. So bringing in some flexibility is really helpful and allowing myself to have a break and if you're communicating with cooperators, acknowledging their contributions is so wonderful for them. And because they tend to be go-betweens, creating space for others to speak up and others' needs to be met, allowing them space to bring up their own needs and their own thoughts can be helpful in acknowledging where they're coming from, not just what the standards are. Very good to know. How can you recognize someone's communication skill, style? So with the soloists, they often tend to be slower paced. Um, in a meeting, they're, they might be almost wandering in rather than walking in with purpose. They often seem less grounded. They might seem maybe a little bit more in their heads or a little bit more up here in general. And you might also see a tendency to do things your own way. People who often march to the beat of their own drummer, you might maybe catch them daydreaming too. Uh, the initiators tend to be much higher energy. They're gonna walk in quickly. They're going to t generally have a lot of confidence in the way they talk and act. And also if they're committed to something, really have that sense of purpose. They're often going to be the people who speak up quickly in a meeting. Um, they're going to have their hand raised, or they might actually not have their hand raised. They might be the person who just blurts out an answer at the beginning of a meeting. Uh, the cooperators are going to be more focused on others in the group. They're going to have a greater awareness of what's going on outside of themselves. They might want to take a support role. They might be the person who volunteers to take the notes at a meeting. They might be somebody who really helps other people speak up and make sure that all points of well all points of view are heard in the room you can sometimes see them acting as maybe a mediator in a group they may be relatively talkative but 
you may not hear their viewpoint as much. You may hear them more acting as the supporter. How do you work with the three communication styles? When you're working with someone who's a soloist, it really helps to give them time to think things through in advance and to prepare. If you're going to be talking to them about something important, for example, if you're going to be having a meeting about a key point for your organization, you can be really helpful by sending them out the agenda ahead of time or the talking points and giving them time to think before they have to come up with an answer. Because soloists do have a slower pace and like to think things through. But when they're given that time, they have incredible things to say, usually very thoughtful things to contribute. Another thing to notice is that if they're being quiet, that doesn't mean they have nothing to contribute. They benefit from gentle invitations to speak up because often they do have ideas and just may not think to say it. One thing I've noticed with the soloist style is sometimes they'll think they've communicated because they've communicated in their head. It hasn't always met the real world yet. So bringing in this invitation is helpful. When you, when you do so, sometimes they can be very detailed and very creative in their answers. When you're working with an initiator, it helps to meet their energy. They respect you when you speak up, when you're confident, when you're not scared to debate. You don't have to worry so much about being gentle with an initiator. You can be very straightforward. They appreciate honesty. They like you to get to the point and to have results in mind. When you're working with cooperators, it helps to be diplomatic. Take everyone's point of view in mind and also to acknowledge them, as I mentioned. They often put in a lot of hard work without broadcasting it, whereas the other two styles, especially the initiators, might broadcast what they're doing a bit more. With cooperators, really listening to them as well as creating a general climate of listening and harmony and also creating a climate where they can relax. Inviting them to let down their hair a little is helpful. Very interesting. Now, based on your dealings with people on mm -hmm. the community and those of them that you already know, would you say that one or more of these styles is more prevalent in members of the community, or does it also have like the one-third, one-third, one-third that you find in the overall population? In our two presentations for the autism community, we didn't find the one-third, one-third, one-third. What we actually saw in both of these talks is that we had probably a fairly equal number identifying as the soloist and the cooperator. And we have had a few identifying as initiators. So we do think all three are represented, but we've seen thus far from our small sample size, a smaller proportion of initiators than the other two styles. And we've seen the styles show up a little differently in the autism community as well. The soloists are very much, when they sit in groups, in our workshops, they set in an amoeba shape. Mm -hmm. And they each have their own kind of unique ideas to contribute, but don't always seem in sync with each other. Whereas the group of cooperators is checking in with each other a lot more, even if they don't have the level of social skills you might see in the general population, you see them making definitely more of an effort. And with the initiators, you see people who are more likely to just blurt something out and be aggressive in their energy. Very good to hear. Now, you earlier mentioned about how to uh, recognize uh, someone's skills. Mm -hmm. Now, for people on the community, in the community and on the spectrum, it's often exceptionally difficult to, mm -hmm. like, read someone's style mm -hmm. or body language or other mm -hmm. aspects of the personality. So do you have uh, any special hints that someone who is on the spectrum might be able to do to find out someone's style to help them communicate more effectively with them? Well, learning about the styles is a really helpful starting point. And from there, they can start observing the people in their life. These styles 
all of us can use all three, but we have one that's dominant, one that we do when we're not thinking, when mm -hmm. we're not trying. And we can actively use the other styles when we make an effort. For example, if I'm a soloist, I may be able to speak up and act like an initiator when need be, but when I'm on my own, I might drift back into my own world. Mm -hmm. So listening to the descriptions and thinking about who that sounds like in your life is helpful. And then just trying to apply these communication styles. Mm -hmm. And there are hints you can use as well. Volume is one of them. If someone's a very quiet speaker, they may be more likely to be a soloist. Mm -hmm. If they're louder, if they're faster, they may be more likely to be an initiator, whereas a cooperator is more in the middle with their pace, more even, more l checking in, listening to other people. Another thing you can do, um, these styles can be hard to observe sometimes, especially if you're um, identified on the autism spectrum. It's a great idea if you know somebody to ask them about their experience. Mm -hmm. You can say, you know, do you tend to be a person who goes and daydreams and is in your own world? Or are you very um, focused on getting things done and moving? Or are you very focused on um, what the group is doing and um, supporting the group? And the answers somebody gives can often be very um, illuminating in terms of what style they are and where their focus is. So if you can't see it, um, you can learn in other ways. Excellent. I understand that some people may be actually skeptical of the uh, Enneagram system, and how would you respond to those people? We've seen some validation studies and some research behind the Enneagram. We've seen the Riso Hudson Enneagram Institute. They have a test. They're the ones we've studied with. They've had their test validated by one of the top psychological research firms that's confirmed that, yes, there are nine distinct personality types, and they are each different and do have a different way of viewing the world through their extensive testing. Another leader in the Enneagram world, Dr. David Daniels, has found connections with research done in the 1960s and 70s into temperament in infants. Uh, people have studied infants and very young children and found that there are nine distinct temperaments you can see in these little kids that do correspond to the nine Enneagram types. Very good to know, very good to know. And speaking of, uh, good to know and good things to learn. Where can our viewers learn more? You can go to our website, berghoffbell.com, and we always encourage you to get in touch with us. Um, you can contact us through our website, or um, you can email or give us a call. We're accessible on social media as well. We have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, um, and we also have in ebook, you can download at our website, and we have audio downloads as well. Um, they are available in CD form by request and at our events, and also um, you can download them via our website. Once again, for our viewers, could you go through the URL of your website, please? Right. So it's spelled B E R G. H O E F B E L L dot com, Berghoffbell dot com. Excellent, excellent. Well, I thank you very much for your time. I also thank you again for uh, the times you have uh, attended our meeting. We understand that you are not just presenters at Ascend, that you are members of Ascend, and we're very grateful for that. Once again, thank you very much for uh, the time you spent with us and the time you've spent with us before. That's it for this week's program. I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. I'm Casey Berghoff. I'm Melanie Bell. And this is Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum. Have a great week. Thank you for, thank you for joining us. Tune in next week.
Welcome to this week's program of Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. <laughs> Today, our guests are Casey Berghoff and Melanie Bell, certified teachers of the Enneagram. And they're going to be teaching us about the communication styles and how it affects the autism community. Will, tell us about your shirt this week. Gladly. This week's shirt is my new neurodiversity shirt. Uh, it represents different ways of thinking and different brain wirings and, and the different